green tea, which you know is almost universally recognized as a healthy beverage, um, actually helps to mow that lawn so that if cancers are trying to grow blood vessels to feed themselves, um, they can't. Antiandrogenic therapy could be used for a wide range of cancers. And in fact, the first pioneering treatments for people as well as dogs are already becoming available. There's 12 different drugs, 11 different cancer types, but the real question is how well do these work in practice? So here is actually the patient survival data from eight different types of cancer. And the bars represent survival time taken from the era in which there was only chemotherapy or surgery or radiation available. But starting in 2004, when antiandrogenic therapies first became available, you can see that there has been a 70 to 100% improvement in survival for people with kidney cancer, multiple myeloma, colorectal cancer, and gastrointestinal stromal tumors. That's impressive. But for other tumors and cancer types, the improvements have only been modest. So I started asking myself, why haven't we been able to do better? And the answer to me is obvious. We're treating cancer too late in the game, when it's already established, and oftentimes it's already spread or metastasized. And as a doctor, I know that once a disease progresses to an advanced stage, achieving a cure can be difficult, if not impossible. So I went back to the biology of angiogenesis and started thinking, could the answer to cancer be preventing angiogenesis, beating cancer at its own game, so that cancers could never become dangerous? This could help healthy people, as well as people who have already beaten cancer once or twice, and want to find a way to keep it from coming back. So to look for a way to prevent angiogenesis in cancer, I went back to look at cancer's causes. And what really intrigued me was when I saw that diet accounts for 30 to 35% of environmentally caused cancer. Now the obvious thing is to think about what we could remove from our diet, what to strip out, take away. But I actually took a completely opposite approach and began asking, what could we be adding to our diet that's naturally antiandrogenic that could boost the body's defense system and beat back those blood vessels that are feeding cancers? In other words, can we eat to starve cancer? Well, the answer is yes, and I'm gonna show you how. And our search for this has taken us to the market, the farm, and to the spice cabinet because what we've discovered is that Mother Nature has laced a large number of foods and beverages and herbs with naturally occurring inhibitors of angiogenesis. So here's a test system we developed. Uh, at the center is a ring from which hundreds of blood vessels are growing out in a starburst fashion. And we can use this system to test dietary factors at concentrations that are attainable by eating. So let me show you what happens when we put in an extract from red grapes, the active ingredient is resveratrol. It's also found in red wine. This inhibits abnormal angiogenesis by 60%. Here's what happens when we add an extract from strawberries. It potently inhibits angiogenesis. An extract from soybeans. And here is a growing list of our anti-angiogenic foods and beverages that we're interested in studying. And for each food type, we believe that there's different potencies within different strains and varietals. And we want to measure this because, well, while you're eating a strawberry or drinking tea, why not select the one that's most potent for preventing cancer? So here are four different teas that we've tested. They're all common ones. Chinese jasmine, Japanese sencha, Earl Grey, and a special blend that we prepared. And you can see clearly that the teas vary in their potency from less potent to more potent. But what's very cool is when we actually combine the two less potent teas together, the combination, the blend, is more potent than either one alone. This means there's food synergy. So what are some of the foods that can actually help our angiogenesis system be just right? Turns out that green tea, which you know is almost universally recognized as a healthy beverage, um, actually helps to mow that lawn so that cancers are trying to grow blood vessels to feed themselves, um, they can't, not as well. Which is why green tea has been shown in so many human studies to be associated with a lower risk of developing not just one cancer like breast cancer or colon cancer, but almost every cancer that's been studied so far. Really uh, pragmatic, and it's, by the way, green tea is the second most consumed beverage in the world after drinking water. Another one, tomatoes. So forget about what you might've heard, the urban legend about lectins and tomatoes being um, part of the Solanacea nightshade family. You know, like all those things I hear through the filter of a scientist. So yeah. The leaves of the tomato suggest it's part of Solanacea, which, which nightshade also belongs to. But nightshade is not the mother organizational principle. It's just one of those many, many plants. And tomatoes do have lectins. Um, and it is true that there are hundreds of lectins out there. And some lectins are actually poisonous. 
Unfortunately, the tomato lectins are not poisonous. Now, how do we know that that's true? It's because studies in humans and in the research lab, including in humans, more than 30,000 men have been studied, okay, as they age, longevity, and they've been found that men who eat two to three servings of cooked tomatoes a week, each serving be about a half cup. This is the dose of a food, half cup of uh, two to three times of cooked tomatoes. So a half cup of tomato sauce on a whole wheat pasta is not very much sauce. Okay, uh, so that's all you need. That frequency of to cooked tomatoes has been shown to lower the risk of developing prostate cancer by 29%. And in those men who did develop prostate cancer, those men who ate more cooked tomatoes had fewer blood vessels feeding their cancer because tomato has lycopene that cuts off the blood supply, anti-angiogenic, mows the lawn, so you don't have too many weeds growing up. And that, that when you looked inside the cancer, fewer blood vessels, less aggressive, better outcome. That's an example. And for women, soy, which also has this mythology, I call it the urban legend of soy being harmful for women. So if they want to avoid breast cancer, because some human forms of breast cancer are estrogen dependent, turns out if you're a chemist, if you know chemistry and you look at human estrogen, that's dangerous for some forms of breast cancer and plant estrogens. If I showed you, if I held up two cards, okay, and I said, are these the same? The plant estrogen looks nothing like the human estrogen. And in fact, scientifically, it blocks the human estrogen. So soy phytoestrogens are like mother nature's tamoxifen, which doctors give to their patients every day. Now, so that's science and that sounds theoretical. So let's talk about the human evidence. A study of 5,000 women who are at the highest risk. These are women who already have breast cancer, okay? They were studied to look at their soy consumption and their risk, right? So this is the highest risk people. And that what, what the study found, it's called the Shanghai Women's Breast Cancer Study. Those women who ate more soy, more soy, had lower mortality, lower mortality, not higher. And those women whose breast cancer had been successfully treated, the more soy they ate, the less chance that their cancer came back to dog them. And so again, this is where science and food as medicine and evidence and measurements um, can really affect us because by the way, each of these diseases that I talked about, breast cancer, prostate cancer, I mentioned colon cancer uh, for green tea, these are conditions that shorten longevity and they shorten health span.